The reports coming out of Russia that the Vladimir Putin regime has threatened attacks on countries that are supplying Ukraine with weapons, countries such as Britain. To discuss this in more detail is our foreign affairs expert Lisa Daftari joining us once again from Los Angeles. Lisa, the United States and Canada have also supplied Ukrainian military with weaponry. Does that mean we could potentially be at risk as well? Potentially, but I think this uh, threat is going out more so than anything else to neighboring countries such as Poland and Romania to say, do not get involved, do not support this war. Uh, we've heard a lot of big, bad, you know, uh, threats coming from Putin, like I'm still here, I'm still relevant, and I'm still thumping my chest and showing you that I am the powerful dictator uh, that was and is is evermore. And uh, because of that, you know, we're hearing threats, and of course, we're, we're covering them because, you know, it, it just shows what his agenda and vision is to not stop at Ukraine. And I think that that's what's very important here. As much as we can throw money and weaponry at this, you know, if, if you have this dictator making these threats and speaking in a way where he's not going to back down, where Ukraine won't be enough and he's going to set his sights on Moldova and whatever comes next, well, then, you know, we have a bigger problem on our hands. And that's what's very symbolic and very much a message here to us um, coming from Putin. I think that's really the, the bigger story here is to say, yes, of course, he's making these threats and countries like Romania and the UK and, and uh, Poland and even the US and Canada are going to continue supporting Ukraine and continue sending funding and weaponry over there and, and obviously to uh, stand behind Ukraine. But again, what is the bottom line? Where will this end? How will this end? Will it ever end? Are more important questions here. And the concern is if he doesn't end up attacking Poland, a NATO country, the NATO would be brought in and therefore the United States and Canada would be brought in and we could see World War III here. Bingo. And I think that that's been the uh, warning ever since this began is to say, do we want to get involved? You know, do we want to even you know, kind of flirt with this uh, notion of of allowing Putin to step into or to uh, kind of, um, you know, go against the, the, the NATO Article 5, which would bring in the West and which would escalate to something perhaps of a, a World War Three. Uh, conflicts. But, you know, that's why I think the West has, has, you know, inserted itself only to supply Ukraine and say, you're going to do the dirty work, of course, if you're going to stand up and roll up your sleeves, and then we'll give you the funding and we'll give you the weaponry. But again, I think this is like a catch 22. It brings us back to Will this then drag the West into uh, a conflict because of our support of NATO and our participation in NATO? So it's, it's very, very complicated and nuanced. You know, the, the, Worst part of this is not knowing the calculations that Putin is making and allowing him to have the next, uh, you know, the next call. You know, what will he do tomorrow? And that's really uh, what has been so frustrating about all of this. There is no end. Uh, and that's where, you know, when you give the funding and you give the weaponry, there is no end to this. Uh, and if we know that the Ukraine won't be able to put an end to this, they won't be able to defeat, they will be able to prolong this. And that is exactly what has happened, you know? Uh, and I've said this before, if you told me a year ago that Russia was going to do this, I would say it, it would take 48 hours for Russia to take Ukraine over. But, you know, the, the fact that, well, the Russians have had some obstacles stand in their way, uh, one of them being, uh, you know, Ukraine standing up to them, they didn't expect that and having this resiliency, yes. But will they be able to complete the job? And that's really the question here before we throw more money, more weaponry, and again, Against, you know, stand the risk of getting involved because of our NATO participation. Lisa, there are reports coming out right now that the Russian economy has contracted 10% since a lot of the sanctions have been implemented by many countries around the world. But now that some of the European nations, including Germany, are refusing Russian oil and gas, apparently that could throw the country into a depression. Yes, and that's exactly right. So, so far, uh, the Russians have been able to not default by paying interest and being able to finagle uh, their way and find new partners such as India and, and the Iranian regime and China uh, and other and North Korea who have doubled down on their support. They don't want to see the Russians fail more so than anything else. They want to see the West fail. It's not that they want the Russians to win. Um, so, and that has been the, the, the miscalculation here. You know, the West never thought that these rogue nations would ever unite 
because they are all after their own um, agenda and to, to progress their own agenda. But what we didn't calculate is that they would band together to overcome the first obstacle, which is really sticking it to the West. And after they overcome that obstacle by helping Russia and supporting Russia in this feat, then they can go out their separate ways and North Korea can go its way and the Iranian regime and Venezuela and China and all the rogue nations can do their own thing. But we never, we never believed that these nations would band together to help Russia, China being the most shocking because China is after its own uh, progress in the, in the region. Um, so yes, that is exactly what, what we're seeing here is that you know Russia um, is in fact under a lot of economic stress, but it's finding ways not to default and not to crash. Now, uh, as you mentioned, Germany refusing oil, a lot of these European nations trying to really um, put you know, their, their mark on this and be able to refuse to support the Russian economy. But again, I think that the Russians will find ways to work around this. U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Ukraine recently. I believe she was in Kyiv to offer up American support for the country's defense against the Russian invasion. And Lisa, evacuations continue in Mariupol as tens of thousands are fleeing the fighting there. Yeah, this has been a long time coming, this evacuation from Maripol. Uh, Maripol has been under siege for, for many, many days now, I think a little over a week uh, since we've been reporting on it. And we've been waiting for the Russians to just call it, you know, to, to claim their victory there. Um, and, and and obviously, to as a consequence, to allow uh, the, the Ukrainians out, especially the women and the children. And that has been very, very slow. Look, they keep changing their minds on this to allow the families out and to keep them there, to allow them out. Out and to have more civilian casualties. Uh, so when there is news about this, of course, we are, um, you know, upset about another Russian takeover. But the fact that this, you know, the, the, the humanitarian aspect of it um, is being answered to is, is a positive in, in some ways. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, well, a very symbolic visit. We had thrown around the idea of someone from uh, the White House visiting and uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, had hoped that it would be President Biden. And he said while there was a risk, he would want the highest level of U.S leadership to make a visit to the country. Uh, and of course, uh, President Biden did not make the trip. But so far, we have had Secretary of State Blinken and now uh, Nancy Pelosi make the visit and obviously symbolic in nature to say we are with you. And uh, the American people support you and the American leadership, of course, is here for you. Lisa, U.S. Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer says he will act on a Biden administration request to add provisions to a $33 billion Ukraine aid package to allow the United States to seize Russian oligarchs' assets and send money from their sale directly to Ukraine? Yeah, not a bad idea by Chuck Schumer to uh, now sanction the oligarchs of Russia. That has been a fixation of this White House to say, you know, we're going to go after the oligarchs because they're very influential. They can perhaps pressure Putin to back down uh, and take their assets and send that money to the people of Ukraine. It makes perfect sense because we're taking money from the, the American people. Uh, meanwhile, we are in a very bad economic state here, as, as you know, in the post-pandemic world, and we're paying six to seven dollars a gallon for gas and all sorts of uh, basic needs have, have uh, you know, have gone skyrocketing in price, uh, near inflation. So now we are um, talking about perhaps a $33 billion aid package, as you, as you said, the last, um, last week, this was put in by the president to pass this bill. And Chuck Schumer said, okay, in addition to this, what we'll do is sanction these rich guys and we'll send the money to Ukraine as well. Look, um, there have been so many aid packages and there is so much money being thrown around here. And as I said earlier, um, when will there be an end to this? This is U.S. taxpayer money. And again, when this country can use this money, where it can be used for the homeless crisis, when it could be used for so many other crises that we have here, um, you know, it's it's. It has to be going for the right purpose and be directed towards a goal uh, for the Ukrainian people. Lisa, security forces in Israel arrested 12 suspected terrorists during raids in a number of villages in the West Bank. Now, this followed a deadly shooting involving a security guard at the entrance of a Jewish town. Yeah, the Jewish town of Ariel. This was Friday. Uh, very sad. These are all innocent, innocent young people who are serving their time in the IDF military. Um, you know, it's every one of these casualties is just so, so heartbreaking. Again, young people who are just serving their time and doing their duty for their for their country. Uh, and um, we really don't talk about. I mean, there have been many, many casualties over the last three weeks based on um, Hamas, and of course, ISIS has taken some sort of. 
responsibility as well to say that we are influencing and we are encouraging the people to do these, uh, you know, do it yourself type uh, terrorist attacks that are supported by Hamas and therefore the Iranian regime. Um, there have also been, um, you know, attacks coming in from Hezbollah, from Lebanon, and from every angle, you, you look at this small country, Israel, the size of New Jersey, that has to fight off these uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, and, and internally as well, imagine going to the market, going to the mall, sending your kids to school, taking the public bus and not feeling safe. Two young men were killed in a, in a, in a, in a bar uh, on a Friday night just last week. So um, when you, we have these 12 arrests, these are just foil plots. Imagine how many more uh, attacks there could have been potentially. And we talk about a lot of these foiled plots that, that happen. Look, the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence is ex extremely um, capable, extremely sharp, smart. They have a lot of intelligence on the ground. And um, when these things go through, it's because, you know, they are everywhere. It's, it's like playing whack-a-mole. It's very difficult to stop them. But when they do, you know, we're happy to say that some potential attacks have been stopped. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett's family received a couple of threatening letters, each containing a bullet over the past week, Lisa. Now, the threats came just days apart. Let me ask you something. Is this the first time the Bennett family has received death threats? Well, he's only been in office for a short period of time, but there have been two of these threats in a short, in this very short period of time. But it's not the first time that a prime minister of Israel has been threatened. If you remember, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin was actually assassinated, um, you know, and that was was an internal actually uh, job in Israeli who did not believe in his policies. We don't know who these people are, but uh, I hope that Israeli intelligence will be able to get to the bottom of it. It must be very, very unsettling for a country that is going through uh, th these types of attacks on the street when the prime minister wants to be strong and be there for the people, when his own family, uh, when it's hitting home so close and his own family is being threatened. Uh, so yes, this is, it's, it's incredible to see how much, uh, you know, how much pressure the Israelis are under from the leadership down to, you know, the children that are playing in the schoolyard. It's, it's, it's incredible to really think about how dangerous it, is, dangerous it is there right now. Absolutely. I want to ask you as well, what's the latest with the Iran nuclear deal? Now, the reason I'm asking is that with Iran, increasing alleged terrorist activities in the Middle East, along with its nuclear production. Many lawmakers, Lisa, point out that the 2015 agreement will really do nothing to curtail the Republic's aggressions. Yes. And you know what's crazy is that we have bipartisan support on the sentiment that you just expressed. There is bipartisan support here in the United States, you know, lawmakers on both sides that are saying this is an awful deal. And when they're asking questions from Blinken, from uh, Jen Psaki at the podium, from President Biden, they're not getting any, any answers. If it's a good deal, why aren't they being transparent? And that's exactly what the lawmakers are saying. Now, what you did, Hal, is something that, that, that the administration is not doing. And you connected the dots. You said, look at all the terror that's being supported in the region. Uh, in Israel, namely, and you can, can you know go further and to say how they're supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon and the insurgencies in Iraq and the Houthis in Yemen and the, the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria, and it goes on and on. When they're supporting this type of terror and exporting their terror still, why are we continuing to be at the negotiating table? More than that, we're trying to take the IRGC, the Revolutionary Guard, off the uh, foreign terror list. Meanwhile, they have admitted to, and our administration has admitted that they are actively trying to assassinate our former and current uh, lawmakers and officials. So when we know that they're trying to assassinate us, when they, we know that they're trying to kill us, when we know that they're still putting money into terrorism, why are we at that negotiating table? And why are we so eager to get a deal that will be meaningless? Just last week, and I'll end with this, the White House put out a report that said, we know that the Iran regime is just you know, months away from a nuclear uh, weapon. If we know that, then why are we trying to get into a meaningless deal with them to release $90 billion more, maybe more than that, than the previous deal, and get nothing out of it? Yeah, sometimes you have to just step back and say, really, what are we doing here? Let's look at the big picture. Lisa, it's being reported that Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign flooded mainstream media outlets with unverified derogatory information about Donald Trump that led to an investigation into the false Russian collusion narrative. Now, Lisa, this proves once again that politics can be quite nasty and dirty. 
Oh, yes. And we had uh, reported about this at the time, you know, uh, some independent media sources had said, you know, this is just, you know, distraction. This is Hillary Clinton trying to take down Donald Trump. And she had influenced the FBI. She influenced lawmakers. She influenced the mainstream media, most importantly, and therefore influenced, uh, you know, American voters. Of course, it didn't and end up going her way, but imagine uh, how many fewer votes she would have gotten had it worked out her way. Uh, and, you know, I think that's why, you know, you had, if you remember how the the uh, covers of so many magazines and newspapers that had already printed out Hillary Clinton's victory the morning for the morning after election day here in the United States, and they had to reprint all of that. And of course, they're very upset to do so to, to admit that Donald Trump won the election. But it just goes to show how dirty politics is, as you said, but also so how easily our law enforcement and our bureaus and our mainstream media can be swayed, where there is no more investigative reporting, where there is no more, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt, where there's no more, you know, um, nonpartisanship from, you know, from, from really looking at things with a clean slate and saying, you know, I'm not biased, I'm going to look at this and see who's telling the truth. And everyone believed Hillary Clinton. And now day after day, we're seeing more coming out of this investigation to show how dirty she played. And um, fortunately, I should say, it did get anywhere with it. I still remember how many Americans threatened to move to Canada if Donald Trump was oh. elected as president. How many actually <laughs> followed right. through on that, right? No, you're right. <laughs> Our foreign affairs expert, Lisa Daftari, thanks so much for joining us from Los Angeles. My pleasure.